Hello, my name is Sam. My favorite color is yellow. And today's theme is body horror. Cool. Makes a change from genocide and baby killing, that's for sure. Now I'm only afraid of two things, right? Swans and geese and body horror. And for a science fiction fantasy family show like Doctor Who, there sure is a lot of it. Honestly, give me Blair Witch Wreck Insidious before I even touch that part of The Empty Child where the bones crack and the man's face becomes a gas mask face. Today I did a deep dive into all of the multimedia and I tried to find every single instance where the Doctor specifically is subjected to life-changing body horror. And I want to find out which is the most egregious example. Which one goes too far? Now, right off the bat, Perry Brown turned into a bird lady for the enjoyments of the general public to fill a daytime slot. Pretty bad. Pretty grim. I give this four tusks out of five. Did you know that Perry Brown um, reverted into her bird-like state in one of the novels? I do not remember what brings it about, but she's on the cover as a bird lady. Either she's a frequenter of the furry fandom, or that shit sticks. Ten Little Aliens, in which Ben, Polly, and the First Doctor are slowly transformed into grey, fleshy, pink alien glump. It's horrible, and by the end of the book, Ben and Polly are more glump than human. The Cybermen. The Cybermen are body horror incarnate, and sometimes even the Daleks and the Weeping Angels like to get involved too. The Doctor receiving her angel yassification only gets a 1 out of 5 since it's undone immediately. But I guess Nightmare in Silver counts, as the Doctor is turned into a Cyberman in a couple different instances. How'd you make Season 7 B Doctor even more twee and insufferable? Damn, that really is a fate worse than death. If we're talking internal modifications, the Doctor receives straight up brain surgery in something inside. He's unnaturally aged against his will in the Leisure Hive, Sound of Drums, and Dalek Master Plan, although you can't really tell on that last one. Body swapped with Davros. Failed medical procedure in the movie. The Crimson Horror. Just... Just the Crimson Horror. Beginning to end. How about Sin Eater, huh? Sin Eater from the comics is strange. The Knife Doctor is put inside a therapy machine that strips all of your demons away from you biologically and literally, creating a giant hulking abomination containing all of his other deformed regenerations because it wasn't designed for Time Lords. Oh, crap. This is a strange way to do fan service, oh, right here. Well, good no, heavens. No, 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 no. You've got Jubilee and Shadow of the Scourge. In Mary's story, the Eighth Doctor is just Frankenstein's monster. He got better. The security system in Alien Bodies samples your DNA and then tries to grow imitations of you, little mutant plant versions of your face that crush you from the inside and out. Jesus Christ, EDA writers. <laughs> Book some therapy. But I think the number one uh, horrific aberration has to go to a kiddie comic called Supernature. It was published in the pages of Doctor Who magazine in 2010. And let's just say, thank God this one wasn't on television. Amy and the Doctor arrive on a prison planet where the inmates are slowly being transformed into animal matter. Really colourful, really lends itself to a comic medium. Insanely gritty. This would not have been out of place in the EDAs or even the Virgin New Adventures. And when even Amy is exposed to... Ugh. You do start wondering how this could totally fit in a series so fantastical and magical with Series 5. After a series of biohazards and backstabbings, the Doctor is exposed himself and turns into a grasshopper? Look, I was brought up on like Spy Kids level of children's body horror, but this would have still tripped me out in 2010. But never fear, because Amy has been experiencing metamorphosis for the last four parts. <laughs> and flies in as a new butterfly lady, shedding her cocoon, and flying in like a superhero. Ah, no, there's the whimsy. There's the whimsy. Thank you to Doctor Who for reawakening my long-buried tryptophobia. It is insane how much body horror, blatant, intense body horror, Doctor Who is allowed to get away with, and I, I'm done with it. 
Fact number two. How about uh, something topical? This one you can check for yourself in the Master Anthology, I Am the Master. A book that seemed to pass everyone by, even the canon diehards and the Master fans. There's a lot of good material in this, guys. And then there's the short story, The Master and Margarita, starring the Sasha Dewan Spymaster. But not only that, the Spymaster, during that massive comical time skip he is subjected to in Spyfall Part 2. Yeah, what did he do hanging around on Earth for those decades? Well, altering the past and creating a foolproof plan? Uh, no. <laughs> I've just had the most infuriating 77 years of my life. He goes to live and be a willing citizen of the Soviet Union. A lot happens over the contents of these 50 fucking pages, but I'll try my best to relay it to you in record time. So the Master is found in Russia, growing mushrooms. The book tells us the Master only just discovered what mushrooms were a couple months after being stranded in Paris and as a result has become such an important contributor to mushroom studies that he's gone under the radar of the Russian equivalent of a unit. Yeah, you can see where this is going. What's craziest about his time working for a Russian intelligence agency is that he genuinely enjoys it. There's parts in this book where he's drinking vodka and unflatteringly staying the night on a neighbor's couch. He grows a real human attachment. He's not really getting up to anything that evil. The master's just taking a break from his own bullshit and being a proud Russian socialist. <laughs> There's nothing in the book that insinuates this is an act. The master's true endgame is to enjoy a Soviet Russia, live as a human for a bit, seem to enjoy their culture, and spread the good word of Leninism. What a fucking choice, book. But, 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 I haven't even spoken about his lizard girlfriend. The first thing the master does in his stay is awaken from hibernation the sole survivor of a Russian group of Silurians. She sticks around as his lab partner, his Liz Shaw, if you will, for his entire extended stay on planet Earth. Together, they hatch such evil schemes as uh, playing the guitar, drinking vodka, faking an alien invasion so that the master can save the day, enjoy some of that Dr. Limelight, and get invited to the Kremlin. He has like a kind of plan that he's uh, passively working on of brainwashing everybody in the West to support communism. It's not a disguise, it's not an act, the master just really fucking likes this place. Before ultimately the master is sabotaged, drugged, and sent to a mushroom trip where he's talking to the third doctor in a massive Silurian temple, tripping his balls out. It's a really weird story, it's a very inconclusive story, it's a very horny story, and I think it especially is writing for a very different master than the one we have seen on screen in series 12. I like this characterization of the master, just a confused layabout who's kind of got nothing going on for him. Because you don't need to own the universe, just see it. The fact that the master grows very close to his next door neighbour, a Russian lady he flirts with and does not want to see any harm come to, implies to me that this is a continuation of the Missy stuff. Uh, no siree, we don't do character development anymore. Someone didn't get the memo. Man, there's so much in here, it's almost like he was writing a spec script for an entire spin-off. But just know, in between here and here, the master goes on a self-discovery tour where he learns a guitar, gets really drunk, creates his own little unit family, sets up a plan to ruin Joe Grant's marriage via mushrooms. It is fucking unseeable that the master went through 77 years of imprisonment on Earth, got up to all these Russian misadventures and still came out of it as this guy. Doctor! It makes no sense. Somebody explain it. I'm finishing off today with a new segment. Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Broken, and today I'm attempting something I don't recommend. And honestly, it's not admirable, it's not brave, but it had to be done. With Broke Cannon, there are some sectors of the universe 
that are straight intimidating to me. Uh, which is why I'm going to my normal go-to coping mechanism. Shit cheap piss vodka. Jesus. Very forthcoming and honest today. And hopefully we can get through the burden of these things, which actually aren't very scary at all, and explain them through the magic of comedy-induced alcohol. Alcohol-induced comedy? One or the other. So it's been a long night <laughs> in preparation, let's just say that. And I'm whipping out the camera today to talk about one little holiday story. You might know it, called Zagreus. And the thing is with Zagreus that you need to know is that Zagreus sits inside your head. And second of all, Zagreus lives among the dead. Third of all, he sits inside your head and most importantly, he eats you whilst you're sleeping. Uh, three fucking discs. Two fucking discs. These plagued me as a kid. I bought these as a very young infant, and I've got this distinct memory of me listening, popping it on, not knowing it's like uh, the ending of an arc, or a sequel story, or a surrealist fucking nightmare. And uh, I've, got, I've got my little headphones in with my little Sony Walkman, still intact. Oh, and I'm just nodding my head along, pretending that I get what's going on. If you do purchase the Grayus, because it's one of the most over-mythologized stories in the Doctor Who canon, books for good reason, um, know that it's a sequel. There's a whole arc that leads up to this, and it's the culmination of the whole Charlie arc, but also Neverland is literally the first part of this story. Neverland ends with the Doctor going to Gallifrey, absorbing all of this anti-time uh, techno-babble, and then becoming possessed by the spirit of Zagreus, an old Time Lord fairy tale. A man. Um, the alcohol will impact this. So <laughs> I'm also winging it. I'm hoping that's the gimmick here. It won't be tidy. It won't be funny, necessarily. But uh, we're doing it one way or the other. I was ready to down that. That is mostly vodka. No fucking way. I suffer for this web series, but not this literally, you know. Also, check on the shirt. You're welcome, right? This is a grey sits inside my head, that's for sure. Watch as the drunken internet silly man recounts the plot of Zagreus, all four hours of it, whilst absolutely plastered. Woo! <laughs> I can see moves like that before I'm breaking down and have it. So, previously, the Doctor and the TARDIS have launched themselves into Ground Zero of the anti-time finale from Neverland, and they both become possessed by Zagreus. The Doctor retains most of his personality, but gets the Eighth Doctor's signature amnesia, and he believes he's in Alice in Wonderland, with everything being some parallel to Lewis Carroll. Please let that be right. Most of this first disc, until the action starts, is Paul McGann sitting around in a box, and there's a rabbit on top of the box, and there's a tiger. I'm pretty sure there's a tiger. Mm. It turns out that the TARDIS is a bit of a... <sighs> stroppy cow, and has been jealous of every single young female companion the Doctor's brought on board. Time machines love drama. Thasmin, we should have been shipping Doctor and TARDIS the whole time. Neil Gaiman got that for reference. <gasps> Disgusting drink! So the TARDIS, which takes on the guise of Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart for some reason, sides with Zagreus to foil a plan from Rassilon, or maybe it's the exact opposite way round, I don't really remember. Either way, the TARDIS is the villain of this piece and actively trying to kill Charlie Pollard. No, TARDIS has sided with Rassilon, that's it, because the TARDIS infected with Zagreus wants the Doctor to also become Zagreus. One big happy family. <coughs> Their plan is to traumatise the Doctor so hard he's got no choice but to plead insanity. But then, the real TARDIS, the little bit of good left, decides, um... I'm going to create the most surreal, impractical defence mechanism ever. And creates free projections based on the Fifth Doctor, the Seventh... And creates free project... And creates free projections based off the, the Fifth Doctor, the Sixth Doctor, and, and the Seventh Doctor. And this is where we get into the meat of the story. Most of these discs, if I still have them, if they can still even be called discs in the state they are in, 
Ah, uh, Once Upon a Time style recasting. So we've got the Fifth Doctor as a local reverend inv investigating a aliens. I, I don't remember. I did not care. We've got Colin Baker playing a Gallifrey historical reenactment of the war against the Great Vampires. And Mr. Winkle. Walton Winkle. He runs a theme park on the remains of Gallifrey. I remember that. What these three characters get up to in their own vicinity, in their own discs, is definitely more of a mystery to me. Uh, that's mostly out of bad memory, though. Meanwhile, the Ape Doctor's out here tripping balls, being guided by um, sample footage, uh, archival audio they have of John Pertwee, who they've sort of sampled Rogue One style into having a important part of the narrative. Whenever I'm in a moment of conflict or moral anguish, I always have the words of the long-dead Mr. Pertwee guiding me. Probably. Uh, a bit morally dubious, though, yeah. Yeah. The TARDIS hopes that through these three individual stories, the Doctor can remember who he is, and that Charlie can assemble a anti-time sword. I'm not making this up. To, to stab Rassilon with. And she does. That's a lot later, though, I think. Zagreus is the audio that's infamous for Big Finish going over their own heads, but they actually did that on a semi-regular. Zagreus's three different stories are mostly uh, distractions, whilst there's a real, like, heavy lore uh, story going on in the bulk. Charlie Pollard has a crossover with the Gallifrey series, and they all come together to melt down the Doctor's TARDIS. <laughs> mm. I was pretty tuned out by that point. Turns out that the Doctor and ancient Time Lord fairy tales of Grace actually have a lot in common, as I guess they are both Time Lord fairy tales. And they collectively boot Rassilon into the Divergent universe. I do not want to get into that shit. <laughs> Jesus, big finish. Then Zagreus gets kind of freaky and changes plans and decides, I'm gonna become a sexy woman and romantically woo the Doctor into letting me back into the main universe. Divergent universe doesn't do it for me, there's no time here. And uh, Creed of the Crowman is set here. So, no one wants to be there. Zagreus even goes as far as to propose to the Doctor and offer uh, the chance to procreate many children to populate the Divergent universe. The Doctor was almost given a harem in Zagreus, and he turns it down. That's a true hero. What the fuck am I saying? Cut, cut that. Cut that. Some people say Gary Russell got a bit pretentious with this story, but I politely refute that with the fact that Zagreus and the Doctor then do biblical parallels as he becomes his Adam to her Eve. All of this comes out of nowhere, by the way. It's a deception, though, because the origin Creation Genesis story of the uh, Le Bibu is actually from the brain of Charlie Pollard. So it's probably not legit, right? I don't quite remember the chronology of these events. I know that it goes into uh, the, a better story by far. <coughs> oh, fuck me! Zagreus is my secret name. Zagreus is the one to blame. Zagreus is the. Uh, each of us are sleeping. Zagreus is my secret name, Zagreus is their secret shame, Zagreus is the Time Lord's shame, uh, the beast that they've been keeping, along with all the other ones, of course. Every other threat to the universe is a Time Lord fairy tale. But uh, i tell you what, Big Finish's one is the most ambitious by far. 2003 was a very big year for Who. Could you imagine that just a year or two later would be getting something so down to earth and grounded as Rose. At this point I'm struggling to keep a coherent train of thought. <laughs> but there are fragmented memories in here of the TARDIS as the Brigadier, like running around chasing up on with a gun, being really bitchy about all the strays the Doctor lets in, and it's also very melodramatic. You'd think it'd be some cold technobabble sci-fi story, and it is that, but at the same time Zagreus is more um, melodramatic than like Doomsday, with the Doctor confessing his love to Charlie, saying, I do love you, Charlie, but that's why you've got to kill me, Charlie! All that sort of business. 
Honestly though, Sagrius was more notable for being just full of continuity fan wank than actual dialogue. Every other line seems to be, there should have been another way, or if we fight like animals, we die like animals. And it's like, guys, we get it, we all love classic Who here. But man, let's throw away history tidbits in here about Rasputin and John F. Kennedy and Jurassic. And I'm starting to understand why people don't think this is a coherent train of thought as a story. Zagreus also makes reference to the Faction Paradox line of books by calling uh, the TARDIS Yuskaroth, who, as we all know, is a Lovecraftian demon, and the TARDIS is also part vampire. Anyway. Man, I'm actually doing better than I thought. I can actually... I can wing this, huh? I can do this whole web series drunk off my tits. <clears throat> That's dangerous information. But at four hours, everybody gets a passing mention. There's cameos from K9 and Irving Briggs Attiel. Sarah Jane Smith at one point in Elizabeth Sladen's only contribution to the main range, uh, tragically. Charlie meets a Jabberwocky at one point. Definitely, there's definitely a Jabberwocky in this. I say that, but there may also be a point in the story where the TARDIS shoots Charlie with a gun. So, uh... That's the segment. Boo -doo -boo -boo -doo -boo.